Hello and welcome back. I'm Raphael Chacon, Director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and it's great to have you back participating in our six-part series on the arts of Africa. The series is called Homage to Africa, and it is also an attempt to uh, introduce you to the fabulous arts of the continent, but also to the works that are currently on view in our exhibition at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture titled Homage to Africa, selections from the Tony Hoyt and Molly Shepard collections. So we're proud to have this exhibition in Missoula, Montana, in the Western United States, and, uh, and also to, uh, to introduce you to the fabulous, rich, and wonderful, diverse traditions of the African continent, as best we can in a very short series. So the series is, um, is in six parts, and I apologize, our last section on the Guinea coast actually took us a little bit into the Sahel, that is the northern part of the Western Sudan, um, namely because you really can't talk about the coast unless you address what's happening inland as well. So that lecture was, in, um, was a, a, almost a two-part uh, lecture itself in that it lasted an hour instead of a roughly half an hour. So today we're gonna talk about an equally interesting part of Africa, and this one we will do it in two parts actually. We're gonna be discussing the art from the wonderful country of Nigeria, one of the most populous countries in Africa, and one of the richest countries in terms of art and culture. So let me begin by, uh, by uh, sharing my screen and introducing you to our PowerPoint. And by the way, at the end of the PowerPoint, there will be uh, a screen identifying how you can, in fact, uh, participate further by taking part in the virtual docent tours, which we have available at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, or if you'd like to schedule a, uh, a live uh, socially distanced tour, that's also possible. And that uh, information is also on that screen. So thanks again for joining us and let's go ahead and get started. So today we're gonna to be discussing a, uh, uh, the art of Nigeria, and we're gonna be talking about the ancient kingdom known as Ile Ife, or the Benin Kingdom. Uh, and then we'll uh, continue with that discussion of, in our following lecture on Nigeria's Yoruba people and their wonderful arts as well. So, the, uh, there's a phrase in Nigeria that, um, that goes something like this, the world began at Ile Ife. Ile Ife is a sacred city. It is in fact the most sacred city in, uh, in the Eastern Guinea coast and certainly in the modern nation state of Nigeria. Uh, Ile Ife is considered a primordial city. That is where the uh, primordial deities, the creator gods actually created humanity and planted this uh, remarkable city. And it was the center of the spiritual world as well as the political world of ancient Nigeria from the Middle Ages forward. So again, uh, if you follow the map here, we've been discussing the art of the western uh, coast of Africa, the Guinea coast. And then we took a little detour to the north so that we could look at the art of ancient Mali as well and Burkina Faso, some of the inland countries of the, uh, of the Western Sudan. But today we're gonna land here in the, um, in the easternmost part of the Guinea coast in the modern nation state of Nigeria to talk about Ile Ife and its importance in um, the, uh, the history of this part of the continent. So again, this is modern day Nigeria here, and you'll see that um, the westernmost regions of Nigeria are, uh, uh, are the home of a people known as the Yoruba. There are, of course, a number of other tribes, and shortly I'll show you a screen um, with uh, the ethno-linguistic groups of the modern nation state of Nigeria. Uh, but the Yoruba is among the most populous um, uh, peoples of that uh, country, and it spans in, in, from the western Nigeria over into the neighboring country of Benin, that is the sliver of a country that you have here to the west. And this is the region known as the Yoruba region of Africa. Again, here is a map uh, in red showing you the country of Nigeria on the easternmost part of the, uh, of the Guinea coast. Uh, and then here is a modern political map showing us the capital city of Abuja, two great rivers that converge and then, uh, and then uh, um, uh, continue on to the, Guinea, the Gulf of Guinea in the Atlantic Ocean. 
The, uh, Nigeria also has a very, very large and impressive city known as Lagos, and there is Lagos there in the westernmost coastal um, regions of the country. And again, but we're interested in looking at the, uh, the peoples of that region known as the Yoruba. So these are two maps that show us uh, some of the uh, uh, geographical uh, aspects of Nigeria. As you can see from this map here, Nigeria is a very diverse country geographically. It has a, a long coastline. It has the delta of the Niger River. Um, and then it has the confluence of the Benue and Niger rivers here in the, at the heart of the country. And Abuja, the, the capital, is not far from that. Uh, but then, as you can see from this map on the right, uh, that it also has a very diverse uh, uh, ecological zones as well. There is, of course, the delta down below with its mangroves and its tropical rainforest regions. And then as you move north in the country, the country becomes more and more um, uh, savanna-like. And up at the very far northeastern part of the country, you actually have almost desertic savanna regions. So these are great plains. Uh, with some hills and some elevation, but for the most part, it's open land with scrub brush uh, and some fresh water, some lakes and rivers uh, in that uh, region as well. As I mentioned, it's a very populous country, but most of the people live along the coast, the, uh, the, east, uh, the easternmost end of the, the Guinea coast. Uh, where a number of cities are located, uh, and also where a number of different ethnic and linguistic uh, groups um, uh, live. But the, by far the most populous group is the Yoruba group, and there you see it in, this left, in the left-hand side map. Uh, and that group is, extends into the neighboring country of Benin, so the boundary between Benin and Nigeria have divided the, uh, the Yoruba people. And it's in the Yoruba region that we find the wonderful city of Ile Ife, the sacred city uh, that was once home to, uh, to great empires, great kingdoms. Uh, so as we continue, here's another map showing you that re Yoruba region, mostly concentrated below the Niger River and west of the, uh, the Niger, uh, and, uh, and mostly within the confines of modern day Nigeria. And again, a piece of it extends over into the Republic of Benin to the west. And it was here that we had two ancient kingdoms, the Oyo Kingdom, and then the Benin Kingdom. And Oyo was in fact centered in the city of Olo, uh, Oyo Ile and uh, in Benin in Benin City. But between these two cities, these two political capitals for these two kingdoms, there was in fact the sacred city of Ile Ife. And, uh, and that is of course a very important place in the history of Nigeria and certainly of this part of the Guinea coast. Uh, there is uh, Osun province, in westernmost uh, Nigeria, where the city of Ile Ife is today. And just to give you a sense, here's a view of what the, what the ancient city might have looked like. This is um, the city of Oyo in an um, in, in ancient city. And here's some of the architecture that existed there up to the uh, late 19th century before much of it was destroyed by the British. Um, and again, these were both political and religious centers for the ancient peoples of this city. This is Oyo Ile, a, another city, a comparable city uh, from the Oyo Empire or Yo, Oyo Kingdom. But let's talk now about Ile Ife, the sacred city. Um, the, the Yoruba have a very, very rich pantheon of deities. Uh, they're known as Orishas. They're spiritual entities. They're, they could be called deities as well. Uh, and they function much like the ancient Greeks did. Uh, they, these were quite colorful characters with a lot of interesting stories, uh, very distinctive characters, uh, and with great, great narratives. Uh, and those, that, that set of myths actually begins at Ile Ife. Remember the maxim, the world begins at Ile Ife. It was there where the paramount deity, a god by the name of Olorun, or Olodumare, uh, Olorun created the world. Uh, and he created the first deities, the founding deities, if you will, Oduduwa and Obatala. And Obatala is said to have created the first humans out of clay, much like in the Judaic myths, um, the creator god Obatala creates the first human out of clay. And Oduduwa was known as the first king of the Yoruba. So the Yoruba lineages, which exist even today, de uh, derive from this divine king in the late 
Middle Ages. Uh, Olorun is, in fact, the supreme deity of the Yoruba pantheon. And Oduduwa and Obatala are, in some ways, the children, if you will, of, Ol uh, of Olorun. Uh, they are said to have created the cosmos as we know it. For example, Oduduwa scattered a handful of dirt over the ocean and thus created the city of Ile'ife. He is said to have then put a cockerel on the land who dug a hole and Oduduwa then planted a palm nut in that hole and from there sprang this enormous tree with 16 branches, which represent the founding families of the early Yoruba states. So much of these stories derive from sometime in the Middle Ages, but they could be far more ancient than that. So what is interesting and what is important to note is that the current kings of the Yoruba regions derive, claim to be descendants of divine kings, that is the creator deities of the Yoruba pantheon. And by the way, that Yoruba pantheon exists not just in Africa, in Nigeria today, but actually has come to the New World in places like Brazil, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic in Haiti, parts of the Caribbean coast. Um, uh, this pantheon exists and is, uh, is considered a great, um, is a great religion. And by the way, in the United States as well, it is considered a great religion. Uh, it goes by different names, Candomblé in, in, uh, in Brazil, uh, Vodun in Africa, um, Santeria in Cuba. Um, so these are just some of the names in the, uh, in the Americas for the religions that ultimately derive from the Yoruba uh, traditions. So what I'm showing you here is an ancient sculpture. And this is an image of one of the divine kings of the Yoruba uh, um, divine kingship. So this is a king, we don't know exactly who this person is, but what we can tell right off the bat is this is indeed a portrait. It is a portrait, a representation of an individual. Now you might be uh, a little bit taken by the proportions because this figure appears to have dwarfish proportions. Um, what, what is being told here is, is two things. One is that what really matters is the degree of portraiture of the facial features the upper body, the accoutrements, the jewelry, the headdress, etc. That's what's most important. And the artist has rendered those things relatively naturalistically. The other thing, the, the fact that this person doesn't have normative human proportions, but seems to have dwarfish proportions, tells us that they are indeed not normal. They are, in fact, divine beings. The Yoruba kings are descendants, and the Yoruba queens are descendants of divine beings. And that shift in proportion more than likely, in fact, tells us that, in fact, we're dealing with a divine personage here, not just a normal, um, regular, uh, regular human being. So this comes from the city of Itayemu, outside of Ife in, uh, in Nigeria, and it dates from the 11th to the 12th century. So these are quite old. We're talking about works of art created in the Middle Ages. Uh, this is cast bronze, uh, excuse me, cast zinc and brass, so it's an ally of these two metals. And one of the things that is true of this region is that there was a whole uh, panoply of, of works of art made in a whole host of different materials, including all kinds of metallurgical techniques, including a significant bronze casting. Here are some of the other images that we have from that uh, amazing uh, place that is the regions around the city of Ife, where these uh, images of the divine kings, the Oni, were created. Here's another beautiful representation of a king, very similar to the one that I just showed you, only what we see here is the torso, the upper body of that figure. And these are not just likenesses, they are more than likely portraits of actual rulers of Ile Ife, the uh, ancient city in the Yoruba, uh, the Yoruba kingdoms. Now, we have given in the Western world a great deal of praise to the development or the rediscovery, if you will, of bronze casting in significant uh, form in, uh, in Renaissance Florence, that is in the late 1420s. But I just want to remind you, this, the, the casting that we're seeing here in Nigeria was happening in the 11th to 12th century. And there's evidence that this casting took place even hundreds of years earlier than that. So, um, you know, let's, let's be fair about the praise. Um, yes, this is significant bronze work in the, in the works of a, uh, a Renaissance sculptor, in this case, uh, Donatello, the famous Renaissance um, uh, Florentine sculptor. Uh, but let's not forget that, uh, 
that ancient Nigerians, ancient Yoruba, were doing this and doing it with aplomb uh, centuries before the Italian Renaissance. So this is one of those uh, remarkable figures. This is a portrait of a seated man from the city of Tada in, uh, in Nigeria. Of course, it's had some breaks over the centuries, but you can see that for the most part, this thing is intact and it shows us the great craftsmanship the great uh, skill that it took to, uh, to create um, objects like this. This happens to be made out of copper, uh, although many different alloys were used in these, um, these royal and aristocratic portraits. And the other important thing to note about this is the, um, the remarkable sense of naturalism that we see, not just in the pose and the configuration and the clothing, but uh, certainly in the physiognomy of the figure, uh, certainly its facial features. These are remarkable, one of the world's great portrait tradi traditions, rivaling anything that we'll see in Renaissance Italy in the 15th uh, and uh, 16th centuries. Another beautiful, uh, exquisite portrait, if you will. And what we see among these portraits is, of course, that they are naturalistic images of real people. Uh, this is the head of another king from Ife. Uh, and this came from an actual known compound in the city of Ile Ife, probably dating from the 12th, maybe the 13th centuries. Um, but these portraits sometimes veer to abstraction. So they are, in general, lifelike, quite naturalistic in in the details, in their details, but sometimes they actually lean towards the abstract or the idealized beauty. And of course, that is true of most royal traditions anywhere in the world, whether you're talking Asia or Europe or the Americas, uh, that royals are different and they are in fact ideal. And of course, if you consider that these lineages are thought to derive from deities, then that the ideal is of course something that might be emphasized by traditional artists among the Yoruba. We not only have images of kings, divine kings, we also have images of divine queen, queens. So this is, for example, a, uh, a beautiful portrait of a, uh, a, an Ife queen, uh, crowned with this beautiful uh, headdress, a crown or possibly a coiffure um, a headdress. So, uh, and again, these are portraits, and they're very lifelike portraits of the individuals who ruled and were the spiritual guides uh, and heirs of the Yoruba tradition. By the way, you might be wondering about the striations. These striations is a tradition, and we see that in many, many parts of Africa, certainly in the Western Guinea coast. Often they uh, derive from actual scarification, that is that we have a representations of scarified lines which represent um, authority, beauty, status in the society, and sometimes even uh, royalty. Uh, in this case, these striations that cover the face are indicative of the divine kingship of the Yoruba, the ancient Yoruba. But you also see other kinds of markings, for example, stipple points or dots uh, that sometimes outline areas of the beard or outline the, the forehead where the hair, uh, the hair begins uh, and the face ends. And so uh, those are also symbols of status and certainly of royalty. Here's another one. This one is in brass. This is from the 12th, anywhere between the 12th and the 15th uh, century, a portrait of a more than likely a Yoruba king. And here's another one. This is the head of Obalufon, uh, a, known, a named individual. And this is, again, a copper alloy piece. And this one comes from the National Commission for Museums and Monuments in Nigeria. So there are uh, a couple hundred of these uh, gorgeous portraits, many of them still in Nigeria, a number of them in, uh, in foreign co uh, collections and museums, uh, particularly in the Western world. And these, have, these objects have indeed fascinated the West and they were highly collectible, particularly in the late 19th century and the early 20th century because of this degree of naturalism, which uh, was compared to the naturalism of the ancient Egyptians, compared to other traditions um, that were on that spectrum between naturalism and abstraction. And these were found to be particularly exceptional uh, examples of art that could uh, be both abstract and naturalistic at once. Uh, they, these artists also worked in other materials, including terracotta. It's entirely possible that they also worked in wood, but of course along this coastline much of the wooden objects have not survived, whereas terracotta and metals have. 
These are some examples of these uh, images uh, carved in terracotta, that is in clay or ceramic, fired ceramic. Uh, again, beautiful portraits, uh, uh, some quite naturalistic and others leaning more towards the idealized or the abstract as we see in the image on the far left. So terracotta was also an important material for the courtly arts of Ile Ife. Sometimes we have double portraits like this royal portrait of a king and queen uh, or a king and his consort, etc. Uh, and these are all, all, both in ter uh, both sculptures or one sculpture is in terracotta. Uh, these images, interestingly enough, remind us of the double portraits that we see among Egyptian pharaohs and uh, uh, in the aristocratic and royal traditions of ancient Egypt. So the, the male and female uh, would be paired in a double in a double portrait. Um, uh, another thing that, that the, uh, the ancient Yoruba shared with ancient Egypt is, of course, the idea of divine kingship, uh, kings who are also deities, or at least the descendants of, of the primordial gods. Another beautiful portrait, this one of a queen uh, in terracotta with this fantastic uh, coiffure headdress and quite naturalistic uh, treatment of the face uh, and her features. These individuals, by the way, are almost always shown at the prime of life, uh, in youth, uh, with uh, a, a vigorous, sort of healthy, robust appearance to, uh, to the, uh, their faces. So I mentioned that a lot of this work is on a spectrum between um, uh, uh, absolutely faithful naturalism on the one hand, and also abstraction on the left. And I want to show you a different kind of portrait, which also exists among the Yoruba, and that is an abstract, a completely abstract image of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the sitter. The Yoruba believe that the individual has a spirit, a spirit, and a very active spiritual life, and that that spirit persists, and that spirit can claim a home. Uh, the spirit is said to rest in portraits that we see that are abstracted. These are some of these. So this is an abstract portrait of this individual. Sometimes these figures were uh, co-joined with a lifelike image. So there was a sense of the outside or the external portrait, as well as the internal or the spiritual portrait of the individual. It's very, very interesting and very rich tradition in Nigeria. So I want to talk now about a different kingdom, and this is actually a, uh, a, one of the two great kingdoms that emerged in the Yoruba region. This is known as the Benin Kingdom of Nigeria, and it actually comes from the eastern side of the state uh, along the edges of the Niger River. And by the way, this Benin, ancient kingdom of Benin, has no connection to the modern nation state of Benin. Um, it's really kind of a, too bad that the modern nation state of, of Benin claimed that name, that title, uh, because it really uh, does not reflect its connections to the ancient kingdom that bore that name. It was a highly centralized kingdom, a highly centralized state that emerged sometime in the 10th uh, century. Um, and that's when it, at least its first uh, dynasty is named. And then the second dynasty apparently derives from the divine kings of Ile Ife in the 13th century. So there's a bit of a gap there between the earliest Benin kingdom and then its resurrection, if you will, in the 13th century. According to those myths, Oran Muyan, the son of Oduduwa, remember him, the, the, uh, the, one of the primordial gods, uh, was the first divine king of the Benin and, uh, and bore the title of Oba, that is a king who is in fact the descendant of a, a deity he assumed control. There is some evidence that Oran Muyan was actually a real individual in the 13th century who introduced the horse to these regions. Nevertheless, we know that this kingdom prospered uh, from beginning in the 13th century until the 19th century. Uh, it was ruled by hereditary title holders, in other, in other words, an, an aristocracy known as the Uzama. And then in addition to that, there were also town chiefs and palace chiefs that also held the kingdom together. Uh, the kingdom continued to expand until about the 17th century. And then in the 19th century, the kingdom was brought down by the British in a punitive expedition in 1897. Uh, the British restored the monarchy in somewhat of a kind of puppet state 
uh, situation in, in modern Nigeria uh, in 1914. That is just ahead uh, of World War, or actually it might have been during World War I. So the other important thing to note is that much like the, uh, the, um, the rest of the Yoruba region, there's a diversity of materials and uh, used mostly to represent uh, the, the kings of this kingdom, the divine kings of this kingdom. And so these works of art are both spiritual objects in that they take us back to the, uh, the divine kingship and its origins, but also their images and the iconography, the symbols on these, on their works of art, also are reminders of the great political power that these kings possessed, uh, uh, these dynasties possessed in the Benin kingdom. So the most famous of Benin's art are a series of bronze plaques. These plaques are in relief. So unlike the three-dimensional heads that we saw from other parts of the Yoruba uh, regions, from Ile, Ife, uh, these plaques from Benin city and the uh, Benin kingdom are actually in relief. Nevertheless, the themes that they address are quite similar in that we have the divine being as the central subject of these, uh, these plaques. Here we see, for example, a divine king seated on horseback. And remember that Oran Muyan, the first king, brought the horse to the Benin kingdom. Uh, the king is held aloft by two attendants. So these are lesser beings. No, uh, they're important, yes, but they are in fact um, flanking the king left and right, holding his attributes of power and, uh, and accompanying him. And then in the left, the lower left corner, you see a servant also holding the attributes of the king's power. The king is always majestic, always dressed to the, uh, to the hilt, uh, dressed with beautiful headdresses, holding symbols of power. In this case, the king holds symmetrically holds two leopards by their tails, attesting to his great power. Uh, the king is also here uh, seated, but his legs, you'll notice, become two mudfish. And the mudfish is a transformative figure, a divine uh, figure in, um, in Benin lore. Uh, so these are attributes of power and majesty in the, uh, in the king himself. So again, this is a divine being who only looks and, uh, and parades among us as if he were flesh and blood like all of us, but indeed is a descendant of kings, uh, a, a descendant of divine uh, beings or deities. So here is a Benin king, again, seated on horseback, this time seated, we see him frontally over, uh, over his horse with his attendant figures, uh, in some cases, soldiers that flank the king left and right. We see another plaque here, left and right, with soldiers, members of the, uh, the military retinue of the king. And then also musicians. You see these very small figures left and right that are uh, tucked in the, uh, the negative spaces surrounding the figure of the king. We see, in fact, um, uh, musicians, so members of the, uh, the royal household or court. These plaques, by the way, uh, were the ornamentation. They were, they, they were kept on the walls and the house posts of the royal compounds in the Benin kingdom. Uh, they were portraits, again, of the rulers. And, uh, and they were highly collectible, so much so that when Europeans started coming there, they began to trade for these things, and then eventually just looted them when, they, when, these, uh, when the royal palaces were brought down in the late 19th century. Uh, Yoruba artists, members of the Benin Kingdom, also worked in a number of different materials. This is, for example, an ivory uh, bracelet. So this would have been worn around the wrist or the arm of, of the wearer, probably more than likely a royal or a member of the royal court. And again, we see again the, the similar themes that we noticed in, uh, in the bronze plaques. We have the king with attendant figures and holding weapons in this case, or fans, symbols of the, the power and the authority of, the, uh, of this being. Uh, all those elements, by the way, also have religious uh, associations as well. So we have the Oba, or the king here, with attendants. Uh, in this case, the attendants are, are known. They are Osa and Oswan. Uh, I believe that's male and female attendants uh, for this particular Benin king. This is actually a, a theme known as a limited triad where you have the Oba with o Osa and Oswan. So some of the themes are repeated from medium to medium among the uh, Benin, uh, by the uh, Benin artists. This is another exquisite work. This one is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art 
in, uh, in New York City. And this is a, uh, a masquette. Uh, this was more than likely worn at the waist by a, uh, a royal, more than likely a king. Uh, and this shows an image of the queen mother. Uh, that is the, the, the mother of the king, the ruling uh, king. And this dates to about 1520. And again, notice that here we have a certain degree of naturalism in the portrait, but also a great deal of abstraction. So we are on this continuum. And some of the imagery that you see here, for example, around the, uh, the neck, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, necklace that she's wearing, or in the headdress, are looking an awful lot like the carvings that we saw along the Guinea coast farther west. Um, and that may be, in fact, a result of contact with Portuguese and other traders from Western Europe that were uh, moving up and down this coast, particularly in the early 16th century. Uh, some of this work, again, in, in ivory was highly collectible to Western Europeans and therefore may have influenced uh, the, uh, the imagery that we see in, uh, in this ancient kingdom. A lot of the work that you see uh, belong to shrines. Uh, most, in fact, most of the portraits and the imagery that we see in these plaques were part of the palace shrines that were, um, that were ubiquitous in the ancient Benin kingdom. This is a restored uh, royal uh, uh, altarpiece, and I'll tell you why it's restored in a, in, in a minute here. But what we see here are different kinds of shrines that actually contained the spirits or the souls, if you will, of the kings themselves. Almost every object here, whether you're talking the plaques up against the wall here, or uh, three-dimensional sculptures of the oba and the attendants, like this sculpture that you, he that you see here, or these portrait heads that are simply bases for uh, carved ivory tusks, elephant tusks. These are thought to be shrines that contain the essence of the sacred beings. So much like an ancient Egyptian tomb, where you would have images that contained the, uh, the soul of or the ka of the pharaoh, these objects, metal bells, metal shrines, metal sculptures, in fact, also were the containers, the uh, uh, repositories, if you will, of the souls, the essences of the Benin kings. So this was a photograph taken in 1970 in a restored palace in uh, the restored palace in Benin City. These photographs, however, date to the 19th century. These are cyanotypes, these kind of blue um, printed images of the shrines as they were in Benin City in the 19th century before they were in fact looted by the British Empire. Uh, these images are uh, the intact shrines. Many of these objects are, no longer exist in Nigeria, but rather form the parts of uh, the core of collections, for example, in the British Museum in London, uh, the Louvre Museum in Paris, and other uh, major important national museums around the Western world. The images take us back to these cities when they were in fact the seat of power of the uh, ancient kingdom. This, for example, is an image of uh, a uh, uh, it, I believe it's a French, no, actually it's a Dutch image of Benin City with the royal palace in the distance. It's uh, towers uh, overlooking the, uh, the city itself and a procession with the king uh, on horseback uh, coming forth from the city. Uh, there are images of that city before its destruction at the hands of the British uh, and the colonial powers. Uh, here are some images. This is a bronze plaque showing us the thatched roofing, uh, one of the great towers, a, an image of a snake coming down. Uh, the snake, by the way, was the messenger of Olokun, uh, the god of the sea. Um, Lokun, as he's known in the Americas, uh, but we see that great serpent coming down, one of the central turrets. Here's another image of that from another uh, a bronze uh, uh, sculpture of the royal palace with that great tower, a turret, if you will, uh, with uh, the snake of um, coming down. The snake, by the way, could represent the, the force of lightning um, or it could represent the sea in this case. Uh, but you see the court in the palace itself in the, in, the, in the plaque that you see here in the lower left. Also, you'll notice that there were sculptures on the roof, these uh, messenger birds, uh, birds known as storks or marabou storks or hornbills, um, and also images of uh, individuals, guards, uh, with uh, wielding rifles, so protecting the, uh, the royal compound. 
So um, to end this, this presentation, I just want to point out that, um, that the British indeed destroyed the heart of this place. And they took objects like this, uh, this ewer here. This is a pitcher, if you will, in the shape of a lion um, a, or a leopard, excuse me. Um, and you can see an image here of the, uh, the colonialist uh, looters. Uh, uh, with a massing of elephant tusks and other objects from removed from the shrines, uh, sculptures, plaques, etc. The, the, the idea of removing these wasn't just taking the spoils of a military uh, escapade uh, and intervention. Uh, it was in some ways putting the, uh, the Benin Kingdom in its place, saying we are in fact the greater power here. And we're not only going to re remove the objects, the finery, if you will, from your royal uh, household, we're going to take your gods and your ancestors with us. And so those people now reside, those entities now reside in the British Museum, in some ways uh, under military occupation. So um, I understand I'm being hyperbolic here, but that's in fact the way that, um, that uh, the, uh, the ancient... Uh, the, the peoples of Nigeria, certainly the modern day peoples of Nigeria, have felt that these objects was a, a form of emasculating, the removal of these objects was a form of emasculating uh, their uh, traditional royalty, and also a way of, uh, of removing their spiritual power. So the, uh, the claims for repatriation, the desire of modern Nigerians to see these objects return to their homelands is based in not just a sense of restoring the dignity of, of these empires, their ancient empires, but it's also a, an attempt to restore the spiritual integrity of their society. Uh, these are some of the other shrines. This one is in the British Museum. And again, these aren't simple objects, narrative storytelling uh, objects. These are in fact shrines that were, just, that were intended to contain the spiritual force the spiritual power, uh, uh, as well as the, the, the political power of the individual. This is an altar known as an Ike Gobo, or the hand and arm of an Oba or king. Um, the Benin Kingdom also had fabulous portraits. And again, many of these are to be found in Western collections, another object in the British Museum. This is an Ioba, a portrait of the Queen Mother. Uh, with this wonderful headdress, uh, a beaded headdress, uh, and also a beautiful uh, rings around the neck, uh, representing jewelry uh, of the Benin Queen. Here are the other sort of celebrated images. Sometimes these portraits um, were the resting um, points for large elephant tusks, uh, or they were just sing uh, singular portraits like the ones that we began our lecture with. Um, the Benin sculptures, uh, Benin portraits tend to be much more abstracted than the other ones that we saw from, uh, from Ile Ife, which tend to be more naturalistic. Uh, these date to about the same period, although these continue well into the 19th century. The, the manufacture of these continued well into the 19th century. And here is our last image, again, of an Iyoba or a queen mother. So thank you very much for joining me today to discuss the ancient kingdoms of Nigeria. Uh, we're gonna continue our conversations about Nigeria and Nigerian art um, and next, uh, at our next lecture. Uh, and we'll talk more about the spirituality of the Yoruba people. Um, and if you'd like to visit the exhibition, uh, you're certainly welcome to visit us and you can, uh, there's instructions on how to do that, how to, so, uh, safely visit us at, you can find us at uh, museum at mso.unt.edu. You can email us there or go online at Montana Museum of Art and Culture. Uh, you can also uh, find there links to our virtual docent tours. So don't forget to subscribe to our, uh, ch our uh, channel on YouTube and we hope to see you soon at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture.